You're listening to the Inquisitive Wren Podcast, the show that brings you philosophical ponderings of your life from a bird's eye view. Now, here's your host, Shah. Welcome back to the Inquisitive Wren Podcast. I'm Shaw, your host. I hope you're all doing very well. Thank you so much for joining me today. And I've got a guest who I have recently found on the Netflix special or docu-series, Surviving Death. And if you've seen this series, I mean, Netflix has a lot of really good programs. But of course, I was particularly interested in Surviving Death because of my work as a medium. So in this series about spirituality, that you know, the spirit in spirituality, the medium in mediumship, Bob Ginsberg started researching the evidence for survival of consciousness. And he really got into this in a very interesting way, the way maybe a lot of people do, uh, which is through a loss, a devastating loss. And he'll tell you a bit more about that in the interview. And during the Netflix docuseries, there were bits that were unsettling for me watching another medium, uh, possibly fake things. And it's so interesting to speak to Bob because we share uh, the same sort of mindset and ideas and beliefs around mediumship that just like there are good and bad people in every profession, that does not exclude mediumship. It does really... um, I suppose, sit heavy on my heart that that's the case because it's the helping profession. Um, However, I recently saw a tweet from a junior doctor on Twitter outlining why she's quit her job because she feels she's not being respected. Um, And my first thought was, well, at least you got out before you hurt someone. And I think that's my whole take on this that when you're in the helping profession, and that includes mediumship, uh, you do, you you know, you are responsible for for the information you give to other people and for how you give that information, just like a junior doctor would be responsible for how they treat other people. And for this lady who's quit her junior doctor post, perhaps being treated badly could affect how she treated patients and, of course, her colleagues as well. So uh, we talk a lot about that, uh, how mediums, you know, it comes to about with personality, which is something I've always talked about. In 2004, Bob and his wife, Fran, founded the Forever Family Foundation. It's foreverfamilyfoundation.org. It's a global not-for-profit organization that educates the public about evidence that we are more than our physical bodies, uh, which is a medium's sole goal is to produce evidence of survival after death, after our physical bodies move on. And Bob also hosts the Signs of Life radio show, but he also heads the foundation's medium evaluation certification program. So they uh, train and vet mediums in the United States. And I think it's throughout the world, actually. So he'll he'll tell you a bit more about that. There is a blog as well, beyondthefivesenses.com. So you can go and check that out. And he's the author of The Medium Explosion, which is a book about how mediums um, really, what they're all about. You know, it's a guide to navigating the world of those who claim to communicate with the dead. You know, I claim to communicate with the dead. I believe I do. And that's why I wanted to talk to Bob because, you know, during the docuseries on Netflix, he really does show what the organization does. But he also talks about how he became a bit more than his scientific brain, than his left brain. And he opened up to uh, the idea that there was more. So without further ado, let's welcome Bob to the show. Welcome, Bob. It's so nice to have you here. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be with you today. Thank you. So, Bob, you've had a very interesting journey and um, you're doing some amazing work, which I'm going to get into uh, in a second. We've got a lot to cover, a lot to talk about. 
But I just wanted to start out asking you about your family foundation, which is so intriguing. It's a not-for-profit, not try and say that quickly, uh, organization. And it really does focus on helping families uh, who've lost loved ones and trying to assimilate that space of grief. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, my wife and I formed a Forever Family Foundation back in 2003, actually. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, it's a, it's a not-for-profit. It's an all-volunteer organization. Uh, nobody connected with the organization has ever been paid. And, you know, we, tre we treasure our volunteers because they all, all work for the greater good. Um, and, uh, you know, we started out... Um, small, you know, and now we're, you know, we have about 12,000 members and we're in over 70 countries. And, and um, it just shows you the interest in the subject matter, because we're talking about predominantly um, evidence of an afterlife, you know, which comes in many, many different forms. Um, and I, I like to think of the foundation as kind of a convergence of science and spirituality, um, because what I found in all my research is that the work of, of, of many physicists today, uh, when you interview them, they sound more like spiritualists than they do scientists, you know, because it's not all that different. You know, it's, we, it, it, it's made of the same stuff. So, you know, basically what our foundation does is we, um, we hold webinars. Uh, we have, as you know, you mentioned in Netflix, we, uh, we let them film one of our grief retreats and we hold four retreats per year. And that's out of all the things we do, that's probably the most valuable uh, because we get to see people when they arrive at the retreat, sometimes their grief is so profound that they can't even smile. And then by Sunday night comes around those same people that couldn't smile are laughing and joking. And there's a, a lightness to them and there's nothing better. You know, we, we get to see tangible results and lots of times those results are long lasting as we talk to them through, through the years. Um, and we have, uh, we've been, we've been uh, holding a uh, live weekly radio show every week since 2005. Um, all of our shows going back um, to 2005 are archived on our website. So the chances are, if you read about somebody and, or you read a book or you hear an interview and you're curious about them, look them up in, in our uh, our uh, search uh, engine and chances are we've interviewed them over the years. So it's a, it's a good resource so people can, can listen to the people that they read about. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we conduct a medium uh, certification process, which result we've also been doing since 2005. Uh, we, we, we did a lot more. We did a, a few more things. My, my wife passed in, 2000 and well two years ago almost and she did um she was the real engine behind everything and there were some things that i just couldn't keep we used to publish a magazine signs of life magazine that's just too much of an enter of a uh, of an endeavor to for me to handle so we stopped that but we've expanded upon you know our other work and uh you know, also because of the Netflix special, our membership has increased, you know, dramatically. That was a, like a big boost. Um, and I think the value to the special, I mean, there were some parts I thought were better than others, but it got people to at least to open their minds to things that they never considered before. So, um, yeah, I mean, by, by the nature of our work, a great many people come to the foundation because they're bereaved in, in some fashion. But I've noticed over the last couple of years is that a lot more people are joining just because like the baby the baby boomers are coming of age and they're starting to question their own mortality. And as you know, in your work, there people tend to fear death um, and it affects the way they live their lives. So, you know, if, if you come to the realization that we're more than our physical bodies, that very often can allow you to live your life with more meaning and, and purpose than you would otherwise. Absolutely. Yes. Now there's a lot of really good nuggets in there. Uh, the Netflix special, the school of mediumship as such, you know, training mediums. One of the things I like what you talk about in your book as well, which I'm, I'm going to come into in a bit more depth in a moment, but 
you do mention about the fact that some mediums are just untrained. They're not, they may have the gift, but they're unexperienced or inexperienced. They haven't been trained. And I completely agree. Certainly in my mediumship, I sat in what we call in the UK, a circle, a mediumship circle, and you develop its mediumship development. And mm -hmm. You sit, you learn, you practice, you master your skill, you work on it hard. And yes, you may have been born, what I believe, born with some of the gifts, but you work on perfecting them, getting them right. And that can take years and years and years of readings, of working one-to-one -one with people, of practice, of getting feedback from people, of doing what we do here uh, is stand on a platform in a spiritualist church and we give readings to people. So I like that you touched upon that. The training is very important. Yeah, I'm glad to hear you say that uh, because mediumship, people don't understand, is very serious business because mediums are sitting with people um, who are very emotional, uh, sometimes really walking a tightrope um, and, and, um, uh, just, you know, trying to, you know, survive the loss of a loved one. And they could go to a, a medium that's inexperienced or, or or fraudulent or just not, you know, very good. And they could walk away um, feeling worse than when they got there, you know. So, uh, and when it, when it comes to mediumship, as you mentioned the book uh, that I wrote, uh, I point out that nobody that's involved in the mental health field, as you well know, has no regulation whatsoever. And mediums, they don't, they should not represent themselves as grief professionals because they're not, unless they have that kind of training. Uh, but there are no, for a medium, I mean, at least in the United States, uh, there are no uh, licensing requirements. There are no ethical guidelines. There are no proficiency, profic proficiency standards um, and um, there's no continuing education. So anybody could go up the next day and say, hey, I'm, I'm Joe the medium and I'm start charging people a lot of money and seeing people. And that, you know, can can be dangerous. Um, I didn't when I wrote the book, I. You know, I didn't make a lot of friends in the mediumship community because I flat out stated that based upon my own research and my experience over the past almost 20 years, that 85 to 90 percent of the mediums out there cannot do what they claim. That's not saying that they're fraudulent. I mean, a small percentage are just that they they have some intuitive ability, as does everybody. Um, and, you know, they've had some intuitive experiences and somebody might have said, hey, you know, you should be a medium or they see so and so on TV. I could do that. And next thing you know, they're out there, you know, practicing. So um, I didn't write the book um, to bash mediumship. It was quite the opposite. I wanted to show that those that can do what they claim provide an invaluable service um, because they, I mean, I've seen it many, many times where they can transform one's grief um, and um, and bring a lot of lightness in, into the darkness. So uh, that's one of the reasons that, that, that I wrote it. But you're absolutely right. People don't tend to take it seriously um, enough. Absolutely. And that's why I liked your perspective, because I completely agree with you. I've certainly been to mediums where I was thinking this was a waste of my time, my money, everything. <laughs> you, you got nothing spot on. Now, as a working medium, I know there's variables in that. It, it depends on your you, the medium. It depends on your connection with spirit. It depends on many things, your mindset in the room, the person you're reading. There's lots of variables in there. But I'm a strong believer if you have done your work, your training, you will get something for someone. And if you're not getting anything, then you, you've you got to be up front and say it. You've got to be up front and say, look, I'm not getting anything. I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry. And that's it. Yeah. But even as a trained medium, you never get to the point where you will make an appointment. You'll accept an appointment. Well, this is my experience. I'd be interested to hear from other mediums out there. I, I'm trained enough where I know this is not the right, I'm not the right medium for you or you're not the right client for me or whatever. It's not going to work. So I won't accept. I'll, I'll have a quick five minute chat with someone first to see if it's right. And if it isn't, 
we won't have the appointment. Yeah, I and and it's you know when people don't realize it's a it's not a direct phone call, you know, you, you know to to the person in spirit and there's a lot of things that have to line up. I mean, you have three parties involved, you know, the person in spirit, the medium and the sitter and there has to be some um resonance among the three. And if something's out of kilter, it's not going to happen or the information is not going to flow. So, um you know, it's a miracle that it happens in the first place, you know. <laughs> so, you know, we understand. I've seen some of the, you know, the best mediums in the world at times, uh, you know, the, the communication is not very spotty with a particular person for whatever reason. Um, and we don't know what the, nobody really knows the reason. Maybe in this person in spirit doesn't want to communicate through that medium, you know. Maybe they're involved in something else, you know. Maybe you're in a group setting and they don't want to um put their loved one um, through any type of uh, yeah. embarrassment or, you know, or, or so, so there's a lot. I mean, I always recommend to people if they want to get a reading, uh, you know, make an appointment to, to have a one-on-one -on -one session, mm -hmm. you know, in a group. Um, I don't have to tell you, I mean, you have constant chatter going on from spirits, you know, lining up and it's very, very hard. You know, I had one of our mediums um, taught me a lesson at one of our retreats, he said to the people, there were about 50 people in the room, and he said, I want everybody to turn to the person next to you and engage them in conversation just for about 20 seconds. Everybody turned to, and within 20 seconds, the noise in the room was like deafening. And then he just, when it was over, he said, welcome to my world. <laughs> you know, so I, yeah. you know, that, you know, made a point, you know, to me about how, how difficult it must be in a group setting. Definitely. Um, and I, I, I I, I feel his pain. Uh, but again, if you are working in that group setting, if you're doing it a lot, I'm sure the gentleman as well would have learned to move aside those uh, voices. Yeah. And that's how we work with spirit. We, we People think we're not in control. There's a part of us that is in control. We can say, okay, there's 10 people, uh, there's 70 in the room. Now I've got 10 spirits lined up. Please stop pushing. <laughs> I will get to who I can get to. You talk to them telepathically. And I know how this sounds. Psychiatrists out there watching, I know how I know what you're thinking. <laughs> um, but and I just did a, a a podcast on clairvoyance, clairaudience, and all the clairs, you know, the clair aliens, the smelling, the tasting, all of that. And some psychiatrists and psychologists believe that it's hallucination and I'm a trained psychologist so and I don't believe that at all but there's a lot more research that needs to be done about that but yes excellent example there lots going on so much going on but as the medium you've got to take control otherwise you'll get nowhere right and as you have rightly pointed out Bob some people come to those sessions even if it's one-on-one -on -one, very bereaved extreme pain, a huge sense of loss. Um, and you've got to have the personality as well uh, to be able to deal with, with that in a very sensitive way. Yeah. And you also, um, I mean, you might be next to another medium and you're both receiving the same information, but there's a, a gift to be, be able to put that information into words or into terms that the sitter will understand. And you may interpret it differently than, than the next medium. That's why the best mediums simply give, give it as they get, you know, they get it, you know, you, that's what, how they train you. And when you go to your spiritualist training, you know, so don't try to make sense of it. The sitter will do that. You know? Exactly. Right. That's my favorite saying. I give what I get. I give what I get. It's not for me to work out. It's for the person I'm giving it to. Right. And if somebody doesn't understand something, I just go back to spirit and say, hey, she doesn't get it. Give me yeah. more. Tell me more. We're literally the medium, the go between. That's it. Right. We're not in you charge know, of that. You, you made me think of something. Um, I once did a survey many years ago. Um, to our membership. And I, one of the questions that I asked was, um, would you prefer to, res to receive communication from your loved one directly 
but through the services of a medium. Mm -hmm. Now, I anticipated that the, the overwhelming majority would say directly, I'd like to communicate that. That wasn't the case. The majority said through a medium. So then I had to probe further to find out why. And when I found out there were two factors, one, uh, people said that if they get the information directly, they will be questioning themselves. Like maybe they're making it up or maybe it's their imagination. Whereas if they had the uh, the, the services of a, of a professional, a medium, then they could trust the information. Mm. So I found that interesting. And the other and the other thing was the fear factor. Yes, definitely. we live in a, in a world where people, you know, the media portrays things that you can't perceive with your physical yes. senses as something to be feared, definitely. and that can be very debilitating. And 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 so people are somehow um, it's hard for us involved in this world to comprehend, but a lot of people just get totally, you know, flipped out when they uh, encounter something that they can't explain. Exactly right. Yes, the fear factor is always number one. I was always the child who didn't mind walking through the, the graveyard with my crucifix in hand and just going, going, ooh, what's what's coming up? And every while everybody else said, we'll wait for you. We'll, we'll, we'll wait. We'll We'll wait until you return. Right. Um, yeah. So I think there is that fear. You've got to have no fear about it all. That's not to say some things haven't frightened me. I have had some interesting experiences, but, you know, you learn how to protect your your energy and yourself and everything else. Um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think that, I mean, and that's a question I've asked countless mediums, um, because after you know witnessing you know hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of readings, mm -hmm. I said, well, why is it that negative energy and negative information never comes through in a reading? And the answer I invariably get from the mediums is that I ask my guides to you know or the universe to, to surround me with mm -hmm. with white light and don't let those negative energies come through. Um, I guess it's working because it, it rarely, if ever, comes through. You know, so. You're right; it does. However. I have had, uh, let's say, dubious individuals, I use that term, you know, who've not lived a very, uh, how do I say, a very helpful life on the earth plane. Uh, for instance, maybe gangs, mafia. Uh, I have had them come through, uh, but I've been very to the point and just said, look, I'm, we're here for love and light. If there's anything else you want to do or say, I'm not the one, <laughs> to, you know, so they will quick, 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 give something and that's it. And I have to say, I felt relieved that I didn't chicken out as such. Yeah. Um, and I entertained it for a minute and then I was done. That was it because there was a message they wanted to get through to someone. Right. And of course, in a public setting, I couldn't say, look, when he was here, he was yeah, I couldn't say that in the, exactly what he was showing me he was and did, uh, you know, for protection of the person and everything else. But I got the message through. Those energies, you, I, I can only explain that there's a feeling about them that is, that makes you sit up like that um i don't feel that i was in danger i'll just be clear to our listeners and viewers but i would on the earth plane i would not have wanted to walk past that person let's let's say that yeah <laughs> and in spirit i'm not saying that they've changed either because that's another misconception i think that people think when people pass over they're all love and light and everything it's not always the case. They're on a journey. That's my experience, guys out there listening, viewing. You may have other views. That's fine. Leave it in the comments and let, let us know. Um, but people are on their journey, I find, in spirit, as much as we are here on the earth plane. And they're still learning. Yeah. I, th I think there's a there's a general uh, progression. Some it's slower for some than others. Exactly. But I think everybody, you know, the way things are designed, you know, moves to higher a higher frequency. And, Absolutely. You know, I, I I'm always um, 
go back to the accounts from near-death experiencers, you know, when they talk about life reviews, because uh, when they have a life review, they, which they describe as sort of a movie reel of, of their entire mm -hmm. life, mm -hmm. um, goes before their eyes, and they feel um, all of the, the good and the happiness and the joy that they cause to others. Mm -hmm. which, which must be a wonderful feeling. But conversely, they also feel all of the harm yes. um, and disruption um, that they caused by their actions or words mm -hmm. to others. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that doesn't feel so good, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of an incentive <laughs> for people to live their lives in, in a better fa uh, fashion. Uh, you know, and the consensus would be that it's all self-judgment, that, that there's not a tribunal to yeah. say you go here or you go there. We, we go and align ourselves with like-minded people, mm -hmm. whether that's good or bad. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where our starting point, you know, may be. Um, so I think that um, I, there's a lot of evidence to take from near-death experiences. You know, I think mm -hmm. it's uh, wonderful evidence that, you know, we survive physical death. Yes. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. Good point. And that brings us to the Netflix series, because the story was just extraordinary. Uh, pulls on the heartstrings as well. Uh, we've all lost people um, that were sudden and, and you just can't explain it. And it did make me question a lot of mediums when you hear their story about how they found out they were a medium, some of them quite late in life. And it's usually through what is known in spiritual circles as the dark night of the soul. Something bad's happened in their life. Um, I don't know, tragedy, something. And all of a sudden they find their mediumistic skills are heightened or they feel they're psychic all of a sudden. Uh, and, I wondered for, for you, I know your story, uh, and it kind of propelled you with that un very unfortunate um, loss of your daughter. Uh, and it kind of propelled you to look into this idea of life after death. And I think you, I share your thoughts. I'm, I think I'm a born skeptic. I still question things always. But was that the case? <laughs> Yeah, I first, before I answer that to your other point, um, my experience has been that an overwhelming number of mediums, a hot, very high percentage, have suffered some sort of, of childhood trauma, mm. whether that be physical trauma or mental trauma. Yeah. So trauma appears to be some sort of a catalyst for intuitive, intuitive exploration or yeah. abilities. Uh, to your other point, uh, yeah, I mean... Uh, before September 1st, 2002, um, I wouldn't be having a conversation with you because I would have thought that it's all a crock. You know, <laughs> I didn't believe in anything with my left minded uh, yeah. brain. You know, I said, well, you know, what could possibly survive death? We are our brains. Our bodies die. The brains are no more. So we're no more. And that was the end of the story. Um, what happened with the. Uh, in my particular cases, on the morning of the, uh, like three o'clock in the morning on the day that my son and my daughter were involved in the car accident, uh, my wife uh, just shot up in bed. She sat up and she was trembling and she was white. I said, what's the matter? She couldn't even talk. I said, what's the matter? And she finally said, you know, something horrible is going to happen today. And I said, well, what does that mean? Can you, you have any details? And she said, I can't tell you, but our lives are going to be changed forever after today. So after she said that, even though I didn't technically didn't believe in all this so-called stuff, we were married many years and there were many years, many instances in those years that my wife Fran would have these um, precognitive moments or visions. And every time she had one, it played out exactly the way she said it. Mm. But they were all good things. But logic told me if she was right then, she very well could be right now. And I, to make a long story short, I watched over my three kids throughout the day. You know, one was getting ready to go back to college the next day. And 
my my middle one was already back at college and my youngest one bailey was 15 and i dropped her off in town uh she was working one last day in her part-time job and then i let my guard down i mean i kick you know i i so guilt I, I i live with um and i let it you know friends vision fade from my awareness and i let my son and my daughter we had two cars we were in a restaurant i let them drive home in one of the cars together to get a head start on school um and we follow right behind and we came upon a horrific accident uh, my daughter didn't survive her injuries and my son uh, had some pretty significant brain injuries and after it became clear about a month later that my son was going to survive his injuries sort of came out of the shock that I was in for the for the month or two. And I said, wait, how did Fran know? Because she knew. And I had a, I, I became obsessed with finding out how she knew. And not only how she knew, if it was possible um, that she still survived in some form. So I took the science route and, and I went across the country meeting with medical doctors and researchers and scientists that studied consciousness. Um, in my effort to determine, you know, if there was anything to this. And I needed to talk with well-credentialed people, you know, because I, uh, that I knew, because in my mind, this stuff was all woo-woo stuff, you know? So was there really any hard evidence? And the evidence that I found was so prevalent and so profound that I couldn't believe that everybody is not aware of it. Um, that most certainly we were more than our physical bodies mm. and our consciousness, uh, could extend, you know, beyond the brain. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. So um, I, you know, eventually that led to forming the, the foundation. You know, my wife, Fran, she didn't need, or she was interested very much in the science, but she didn't need that because she had this inner spiritual knowledge mm -hmm. that I didn't possess. So in essence, you know, the, the foundation was a reflection of the two of us because science on one side, spirituality on the other, you know, and that's how we, uh, we grew to evolve. It was wonderful. And listeners, the special I'm referring to is Surviving Death, uh, which is on uh, Netflix. You can watch it now. It's a docu-series. It's still airing. And um, it does show that there are, a lot of people that come to you guys um and it had your your lovely wife Fran in in the docu series as well who's uh sadly passed on as well uh now but it shows that so many people were interested are interested and keen to learn how to do it themselves and i wonder if that's just the work Fran was meant to do. Well, this certainly became her her life um, over the past, you know, 20 years. That was, she worked literally, you know, 18 hours every day, seven days a week. I mean, we never went on vacation. He, she never took a day off. And, you know, and, and what she would do, which I stopped doing because I simply don't have the time or the patience for it is that she would she would answer the phone no matter when it rang and i'd you know and and i'd come I'd, I'd walk into the office and she'd have you know stacks and stacks and stacks of work you know running a foundation that she had to get to and she'd stay on the phone with a person for two or three hours because that's what they needed mm -hmm. you know because they were bereaved and you know and she would try to comfort them and educate them and so forth so uh yeah that certainly was um uh, was her her mission i mean you know the spiritualist argument might be that that was why we suffered you know all the tragedy in our life because bringing us to this point and I, you know i can make arguments for and against that i don't know but um it certainly um became you know that we became identified as especially fran as the foundation was who she was you know so yeah uh, and 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 I mentioned the grief retreats, and I and I did. Um, she was suffering from pancreatic cancer, and she was it was just a horrible, horrible way to go. Uh, and I couldn't even converse with her, you know, towards the end because it just takes over your whole body. But I was able to get little snippets, and one of the things that I finally addressed was, you know, what she wanted me to continue, and she said 
got to be number one is the grief retreats. You, you know, you got to keep doing those because, as I mentioned, that's the only place we get to see, you know, the effect of the information and the work that we do you know, that can have on somebody's life. And, you know, you see comments, you know, people post comments on these. Not, there are these sites that that rate not not for profits and you can leave your, your, your the comments. And I never for years and years, I never looked at it. And I looked I looked at it. And it's like a thousand comments and people saying things like you changed my life or uh, you helped me get through the darkest time. And, and, and you know, you want to cry when you read them because it's, you know, you, you when you know, as you well know, when, when you're stripped down to nothing, you know, like losing a child, yes. um, things that meant a lot to you before material things don't mean anything anymore. And the only thing that brings you any type of, of comfort is being able to help somebody, you know, and I used to roll my eyes when people used to say that to me 20 years ago. But then when I got to live it, it's really true. You know, I mean, I walk away from the retreats and it's 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 rough because, you know, you, as somebody that's empathic uh, to agree, a, de a degree, mm. I feel everybody's sorrow, mm. you know, because I'm with them. I'm one of them, you know. So you take that home, but I'm, that's balanced by the you know, the smiles, you know, and the laughter that you see at the end. So it's uh, it's something that I look forward to. And we, we expanded it. We used to do three a year, and now we do four a year. Wow. Amazing. And um, it brings me to this quote I found from the French novelist Proust, who said, happiness is beneficial for the body, but it is grief that develops the powers of the mind. And I think when people are grieving, something happens to the mind. Now, I, I'm not going to go into the scientific part, but I think something mind, body, soul, something happens where you feel a piece of you uh, almost become stagnant. You're unable to move on as such. It's it's like dead weight. Someone yeah. once described it to me. Uh, they were in the midst of grief. And they said, the only thing I can say is I feel like a dead weight. I can't move i can't get any i can't do anything and i think the it's the mind and i think that's what spiritualists or spiritualism or mediumship does it doesn't uh eliminate your grief and i i want to say to people out there if you're looking to come to a medium great and we can help hopefully we can help but I never give anybody the impression that it will eliminate your grief. I think it can help you on your journey right. and give you some hope. And there's a sense of relief that there is life beyond the physical. But what are your thoughts about that, Bob? Well, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I begin every retreat in my opening remarks by saying just that, that this is not a magic pill. Anybody that says to you they're going to cure your grief just walk away because it's you know it, it's just simply not true i mean you're always going to have that hole in your heart um however what happens and, and you're right and your other point is that when, when you lose somebody um it feels like a part of you has died you know when you have to search really hard to find something to to fill that that void and that's why so many people that like myself that never thought about such things i mean the grief was a was a trigger to, mm -hmm. to to explore, you know, and to try to save myself, you know, mm -hmm. at the very, I tell people today, I didn't help start the foundation because I wanted to help people. I was looking for a way that I was going to survive my own right. grief, the the, the, the the death of my own daughter. Mm -hmm. That changed, of course, you know, as the years went by. But I think the advantage from a grief perspective is, and clinical studies that have been published in peer-reviewed journals have showed this, that those who believe that their loved ones still survive in some form do better in their grief than those who don't. And that makes perfect sense because yes. what else when you're stripped down to nothing could give you any hope or comfort than believing that your loved one still exists. So I, I think that what happens with grief is that um, it changes. It never goes away, but it, it changes. And over the years, there's, a certain you know lightness that goes to it i mean you may wake up i remember i, I woke up one morning and i said wait I, wait i i went for uh 
you know, three hours without thinking of my daughter. And then I would then I went through it the whole day without thinking of her, you know, and then at first you feel guilty about that, you know, but then uh, so as time goes on, it, it, you put your grief in its place and, and you know, and you move on. Um, but uh, yeah, to suggest that, I mean, we call these retreats, you know, grief transformation retreats, and we're hoping to, in some small way to transform the grief into something else, but we never suggest that, that this is the answer, you know? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And that would be the case anyway with any uh, typical grief bereavement program as well. Uh, you, there are stages of grief. I, I believe that as well. There's denial and all the other stages. But that can happen, I believe, in mediumship too. Uh, but it is quite extraordinary. So you mentioned the research papers and there's a lot out there. I don't believe there's enough that's been done. I don't know why. I think in the UK, it's funding. You know, it takes a lot of money to do these research projects. I don't know if people are that interested in dedicating that money to it. I know there have been people who have done. Uh, some psychiatrists have done as well. Um, but I think more research has to be done. It takes years. It takes time. The other thing we're up against, Bob, and I, I've always said this, and I know it sounds a bit odd, but we only have this mind to work this out. And I think it's beyond the human mind, a lot of what we're talking about here. I don't know if we even have the scope to work it out. Um, Einstein spoke about energy and and all that kind of thing, you know, vibration but I, I think people just took it as, oh, he's talking about science. But as we know, it's more than that. But what are your thoughts about that? Research being done more? Yeah, well, you know, uh, and you hit it right on the head. I mean, the issue is funding. I mean, um, you can, you know, organizations like, you know, to to fight cancer mm. and so forth, um, they just, the money just keeps flowing. But, you know, as far as um, most of the things, you know, saying that the mind is, can act inde independently of the physical brain is heresy to materialist sciences. They simply don't believe it. Right. So you have that battle. Yes. Um, and you could pre you could present all of the studies and all the evidence to them mm -hmm. in a debate, and they will just, they're not aware of it because they choose to, to ignore the evidence. Because it if it was true, if what we were saying was true, it would challenge their whole education and the whole professional careers. So they, they don't want to even entertain the possibility. Um, there are things that are studied in a, in a clinical, like a laboratory type setting, like mediumship, yeah. where they use blinded protocol, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and the odds against chance, you know, are, are astronomical of these things, yeah. uh, mediums guessing in information as it gets more and more and more specific. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's near death experience research, there's research with deathbed visions that people oh. have when they're near death, yes. reincarnation. A lot of the, these things are were depicted in that Netflix, you know, documentary. Oh. So um, the most though profound uh, research takes place in, um, in in the consciousness arena, and like things like telepathy um, and precognition and presentiment. You know, the because mm -hmm. uh, it, it it shows with, with with you know with odds against chance, sometimes in the billions to one, mm -hmm. that these things are real. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. simple things like card guessing. You know, I mean. Uh, J.B. Ryan at the now at the uh, who's long since passed, but the Ryan Institute keeps going, and he was a forerunner in ESP research. He used to take he called Zener cards, and there was a series of five different cards. Each card had a a different geometric shape on it, and he would you know have a machine you know mix them up and then have the person regular people guess what card was coming up next. Now there's five cards, so the odds are one in five that you're going to guess by chance what the correct card is. So you would expect a 20% success rate. But then, you know, uh, when you have, let's say a 26 or a 27% uh, rate over 
a huge database of, of, of hundreds and thousands and sometimes millions of tests that becomes st uh, statistically significant, you know. And it shows that, uh, you know, things like distant healing, mm -hmm. power of prayer and, and psychokinesis, mind affecting mm -hmm. matter, remote viewing, mm -hmm. where people can expend, uh, extend their mind to a distant location. Mm -hmm. I did my own experiment with that and it's, you know, it was extraordinary. Yeah. So that shows that, you know, I had somebody in an informal experiment I did. I'm, I was sitting in New York um, and I was drawing pictures and then the person um, in California, 3,000 miles away, was tuning in and drawing the exact same pictures that I was drawing. So I sat down after that. I said, okay, here's Bob in mm -hmm. New York with his brain in his skull. Mm -hmm. And there's this woman in California with her brain in her skull. So if material science is right, how could this happen? It can't, right? So, so that was like when I did my own work instead of reading about it, yeah. that's what really propelled me to the next level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fascinating i love it remote viewing one of my favorite things to do i have this story that i always talk about i call a train ticket lady where she rang up she had misplaced her train ticket to see her son and she asked if i could get a sense or feel of it and i did i saw it as well claire buoyantly i could see it claire audiently i could hear oh it's over there it's over there and then I got this sort of clairsentience, this feeling that it had wasn't out of the home. It was in the home. And I could see a bag and I told her where it was. Extraordinary. To this day, and that's happened, what, 10 years ago now? Maybe seven years ago? I'm, I'm still stunned and amazed. I'm always stunned and amazed still. If you'd like to be a guest on the show, email us at inquire at theinquisitiverin.com. That's E-N-Q-U-I-R-E -E at theinquisitiveren.com. Be sure to check all social media, especially the Facebook page, for new topics being discussed. And if you can contribute, please let us know so you can be a guest on the show. Now, back to the show. Right. Not always. Well, you, well, you know, uh, people sometimes ask, well, why do you talk about, you know, ESP and all this other stuff? What does it have to do with an afterlife? <laughs> It lays the groundwork because yeah. first you have to show that we're not our brains, yeah. that, that our minds, you can call it our mind or our soul or our consciousness. Mm -hmm. But if, if that extends beyond the brain, mm -hmm. then it makes it plausible for us to survive our physical death because our mind still exists. I mean, in essence, what you're doing in mediumship is still telepathy. It's mind-to-mind -mind communication, except the person you're communicating with doesn't have a physical body, but it's still mind-to-mind -mind communication. Exactly. You know, so I always try to interject that in, in, in like any talk that I do, because you have to understand that before you can make the next leap, if you're talking to a skeptic or an open-minded skeptic, exactly. to believing in life after death. Exactly. So is this the type of uh, content that people can get when they listen to your radio show, Signs of Life? Yeah, we have uh, four or five different formats. I mean, it used to be a years back, it used to be a straight interview, which every every year, every show we would interview a scientist or a researcher mm -hmm. or somebody in the field. That got just to be too much work for me because that meant I had to read four to five books a month. And it's a lot, especially when it's some heavy science involved sometimes. Yeah. So we have different formats. We even have one show called Mediums and Messages where one of our certified mediums will invite another certified medium. And they'll just do readings for people that call in. You know, we have discussion shows. So yeah, people can tune in via our website every Thursday night and, you know, and listen to it. And it's, you know, especially, um, uh, because of the time difference, yeah. uh, a lot of people would prefer not to listen live and they listen afterwards from the archives. Yeah. Right. OK. And also your book, because I uh, mentioned this before, The Medium Explosion, A Guide to Navigating the World of Those Who Claim to Communicate from the Dead. I still say that. I'll say, you know what? I claim to communicate <laughs> with those of that. I think I'm doing it, you know. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, I mean, that, 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 uh, in, in that book, I mean, I, I outlined first, not a lot, but some of the evidence that we've been talking about. Uh, then I get into, I call it the medium explosion because mm. 
much like the, I mean, there was an explosion of, of mediums back in the Victorian era, you know, yes. 100, oh, 150 yes. years ago. Um, but it's a resurgence of this. But uh, it's it's um, now, you know, with mediums doing readings via Zoom instead of in person because mm -hmm. of the pandemic, um, the opportunity for fraud is much greater. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, Absolutely. You know, uh, we, we, we uh, caught a medium that was doing a, a reading on Zoom and just as we're doing now, on the left side of the screen, she had the sitter. And on the right side of the screen, she had the, the woman's, the sitter's Facebook page open. And during the reading, she was just reading back, spitting back everything that she found in Facebook. And the sitter had no idea. And the sitter thought this was the greatest medium in the world. But it was wow. a total, total fraud. You know, so, uh, again, most, you know, good mediums don't resort to such ta yeah. tactics. But like in any profession is good and bad you know it's so. true because they don't have to resort to that exactly one of the things i always do is ask people or ask my guys to give me things that nobody else would know that you cannot find anywhere because of the onslaught of social media i mean i've been doing this for over 25 years so a while back i didn't have to worry about that kind of thing but also I trust that people will come to me, the right people will come as well. So, but there are a lot of skeptics. I saw someone on YouTube talking about mediums, like a Ponzi scheme or so, what did they refer to them? Something like that, like a, a Ponzi scheme or something. Yeah. I thought, wow, but that's, um, but I suppose this is where we are. This is, you know, there will always be skeptics and there will always be people and unfortunately, as you rightly say, Bob, I think it's about personality. So just because you have a gift doesn't mean you're a good person or that you want to use it well or properly or. Yeah. And, and you know, and there's nothing wrong with being a personal communicator. You know, nothing says that you have to go out and become a medium. You yeah. could just use your gift and, you know, in your everyday life, you know, exactly. and if you want to help people, that's fine. But um People should really uh, do some inner reflection before they make the jump into becoming becoming a medium. Yeah. Especially if you're going to charge people. Yeah. And really, sort of as we're winding up, I wanted to ask you about your thoughts on the um, onslaught. It's been a few years now of TV mediums. Um, I mean, the Netflix show is different. I I feel it's very different, but because it's educational and it's quite different, um, it explores many different aspects. But there has been an onslaught of mediums on TV. I had I've done some TV in the UK, and a couple of years ago, I won't say the station. But they contacted me and asked me to channel the Queen Mother, who's already passed the spirit. You know who you are, um, station out there. I did turn it down. Now, it wasn't because <laughs> I didn't think I could do it. I have to laugh. I shouldn't, but I, I have to laugh at this. It was just, it was too gimmicky for me. Yeah. And it, it's very serious. Now, if the family had asked, that's different. Right. But I wasn't going to get on telly and start. That's just gimmicky. So I've, I've gone a little off track. But what are your thoughts about mediums on TV and that work being done? Yeah, I, and, and, and you're right. You have to be very careful. We've been burned a million times. And that's why before we agreed to be on the Netflix uh docu-series we met with them for four and a half hours you know talking excellent make sure that they were doing it for the right reasons yes. as far as tv mediums go listen several of the mediums that we've certified you know way back have gone on to become very famous because of tv shows wow. um, i have a problem with tv shows as i explain to people because you know the medium walks into a pizza shop and the cameras just happen to be there behind the counter. And I say to people, let me ask you something. If you were the producer of a show uh, and the show um, revolved around the ratings mm -hmm. and you know that TV shows are highly edited, you know, they may film 10 hours for, for 15 minutes worth of content. Do you think that they're going to show you the hits or the misses? You know, because so, so if you see some, some hits, 
um, there may have been 30 misses that you don't see. So you can't evaluate the ability of a million of, of a medium uh, by a TV show. Now, that doesn't mean the medium's a bad medium. You know, they just, this is the nature of, of, of the media. This is what they do. So I'm not a big fan of those types of shows mm -hmm. where they, you know, do readings for people that are mm -hmm. filmed and edited. Look, you know, in the Netflix show, just with us, they filmed approximately 70 hours of film wow. between me and my wife and our home and that here and in the retreat. And, and that 70 hours got whittled down to, you know, tops, you know, 30 minutes of content. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's that's what happens in TV yeah. shows. And the problem is those TV shows affected our other mediums because somebody would go, you know, other mediums that have been certified by the mm -hmm. foundation because they would go to another medium and the medium, you know, no medium is 100% accurate. Mm -hmm. You know, so the medium would get something wrong and then the person would say, well, then I don't, I didn't like the readings. Mm -hmm. And why? Well, you got something wrong. Mm -hmm. And the medium explains, well, even the best mediums are like, you know, 80, 85% accurate. And they say, well, so-and-so on TV <laughs> never gets anything wrong. So it sets a standard that's impossible yeah. to live up to. So that's why I have a problem with, with me medium TV shows. Yeah. Exactly right. Exactly right. We do have a famous medium here in the UK, a male. Uh, we have several, but uh, somebody rang up a reading and they said, you know, I saw so-and-so. And he didn't give me this or that. And I said, but that doesn't mean he's not a good medium. He just, yes, but he's on TV. Well, it's a lot of people are on TV. Right. <laughs> exactly right. Uh, they will show you the best bits, of course. But mm. there is a lot of it at the moment. Um, there's a lot of talk about mediumship on TV and putting disclaimers up. And all that kind of thing. So, of course, it's a, it's seen as the paranormal or pseudoscience as such. Uh, and I, I think until the research, more research is done, and I'm not sure if I'll see it in my lifetime. Um, but uh, because you know, I mean, I, when we went to Turkey, I stepped into Delphi, and I could barely stand up. I just kept getting these visions of all these people going to see mediums and this has been going on for centuries and centuries and centuries far back way back than what we know and i was shocked i was stunned but i had no energy it just drained me yeah. it's been happening for ages and still royal families still see diviners and psychics and tea readers and all sorts all divination all divination mm -hmm. i don't know if we'll ever be able to explain it fully with this mind i don't know if we have the language for it yet well you know as you you know you mentioned einstein and, and you know sometimes scientists get inspiration from non-physical sources mm -hmm. where do you think they come up with all the ideas mm -hmm. you know so it may exactly. very well that we have we have help from from those that reside yeah. on the other side, you know. Oh. oh, that's a good point, Bob. That's very positive to my cynical mind. <laughs> that's very positive thought. I needed to hear that. Thank <laughs> you. For that. No, it's true. You're right. Maybe that they will help us in that regard to um to get to that point. Absolutely right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bob. This has been fascinating. Now, all of the links to Forever Family Foundation will be in the show notes to the podcast, the radio show. It's a bit like a podcast, but it is a radio show in that it's interactive, really. People call in. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that. Also, Bob's book is on Amazon. Uh, it's also, you can, uh, it's the Kindle version is on there as well. So go and pick up the Medium Explosion book listen to the signs of life radio show and also watch the netflix series surviving death it is fantastic you will find you know if you're a medium hold on to your horses there'll be bits in there that you will hate <laughs> but um there'll there's lots of good stories in there and people will pull on your heartstrings there's so many brilliant stories in there and bob's in particular so I thank you so much. Thank you for the work that you're doing to help mediums get further and also to help to heal people 
through their grief, facilitating them through the grief process, through. Thank, thank you. I appreciate that. Death. It was my pleasure being here with you. Thank you so much, Bob. Come back again. Okay, I will. Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure you subscribe and follow on all streaming platforms. Leave me a comment and also let me know if there's any particular topics you'd like me to discuss. See you next time.